If you're a parent, you know the importance of education for our children. And if your children are grown, you know the importance of a quality education for your grandchildren. Well, hello and welcome to Stand in the Gap. I'm Sam Rohr, and I'll be joined shortly by Pastor Isaac Crockett. The scripture speaks extensively about the education of children. In Proverbs, it says, train up a child in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from that training. The biblical model as given to Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6 is for fathers to take the primary responsibility to make sure that a God-fearing education is accomplished by example, word, and action so that the children will know who God is and what He has done, and that there's a direct relationship between fearing and obeying God and expecting blessing and prosperity, security, and good health in the culture. William Penn in Pennsylvania and other founders knew that the only way God could raise up a nation or continue to bless a nation would be, as they said, if a virtuous and godly education of the youth was carefully executed. Well, the devil also knows that getting a hold of the youth is a high-level prize. And we know that in our nation, education from the elementary through secondary levels as well as, of course, university levels, has been infiltrated and hijacked with a rewriting of history, a redefining of truth, and now a generation with less than 2% holding to a biblical worldview. Soviet Communist Vladimir Lenin embraced the concept of capturing the youth and expressed it well when he said these words, Give me just one generation of youth, and I'll transform the whole world. Give me four years to teach the children, and the seed that I have sown will never be uprooted. He also said, destroy the family, and you destroy the country. Well, the advent of COVID and the disturbance of education has awakened millions of parents across America to what their children are either not learning or perhaps actually learning in their education, particularly public school classrooms. And the aggressive march forward of the so-called Equality Act in Congress, H.R. 5, will create even more dangers for every child in the public classroom as they will be shamelessly taught an evolutionary and demonic view about God, human sexuality, marriage, and the purpose of life. So what do we do? Well, in part one today, we're going to define Christian education and what it means to train up your child. We'll make the case for Christian education and how you can identify true education, true Christian education. And next week in part two, we're going to discuss why it's critical that if your children are in the government schools, that you need to get them out of Egypt now. And then we'll conclude with multiple options of whether you're a parent of a school-aged child or a grandparent or pastor with children under your influence to get your children a Christian education. My special guest is Jeff Keaton. He's the founder and the president of Renew a Nation, and that website is on just the screen right now. And with that, let me welcome to the program right now Jeff Keaton. Jeff, uh, thank you so much for being with Isaac and me today on Stand in the Gap. Thank you so much, Sam. It's a great privilege. I look forward to our time together. Well, we do as well. You know, uh, Jeff, every person has a unique uh, journey in life. So have you. You've had one of those. And I want you to, as a way of helping to explain why you're in education, and as we get into this program, you started out as a pastor, but you are now in Christian education. Looking back, can you have any idea why God started you in the pulpit and moved you now into a focus on Christian education of our young people? Absolutely. Um, I came out of college. I took an inner city church in Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and uh, I had Christian education was not even close to on my radar. And I end up after uh, three or four years with 100 plus children and teenagers in our church. Most of their parents were new Christians. Uh, many of them had come out of homes of drug addicts and alcoholics. And all of these kids, with the exception of one, was in a public school. And so um, I said to my student ministries pastor, go live in those public schools. And we ended up leading a Christian club in every middle and senior high school in Brad County, Florida, which was 32 Christian clubs. 
as I went in and spoke in those clubs, it dawned on me that our children uh, were fighting a losing battle. I had one goal. We had led these young people to Christ. We wanted to disciple them and unleash them on the world. And it dawned on me, I only have these kids for one or two hours a week at church. The school here has them for 35 or 40 hours a week. And the kids were coming to me and saying, Pastor, do you understand that everything you're teaching us at church, they're teaching us the exact opposite at school? And uh, as, it, as I began to learn more and more about what they were being taught, I began to dream. What if I had these kids for 35 or 40 hours a week in my church? Then I could really change their thinking. And uh, did not become a reality in South Florida, but when I moved to Virginia, I was able to launch a school, ended up with hundreds and hundreds of students, and I was able to do exactly what I imagined, disciple children for 35 or 40 hours a week. And oh, what a difference it made. And today there's hundreds of young men and women who came through our school who are changing the world in the area of government, business, medicine, law, ministry. And so I came to it kind of naturally, organically. I just want to disciple children. And it dawned on me that Christian education was one of the greatest tools available to us. And, and Jeff, God has done something great with your ministry, and that's why you're on the program today. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to stay with us because we're going to walk into this next segment in talking about uh, Christian education. And Jeff is going to make the case for Christian education, plus a whole lot more that I think will be of great value to you. We'll be back in just a moment. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant. Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping, This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap, and we're talking with our friend uh, from Renew a Nation, uh, Jeff Keaton here, the founder and president CEO of Renew a Nation. And Jeff, I really like what you were talking about, uh, because on this program we're talking about train up a child and and training children, looking at uh, the education side of things, Christian education in particular. But I love what you said about a heart for discipling children, because so many times when we think of discipleship, we think of adults, but true discipleship can start when they're children and they can form their biblical worldview. That their Children are forming their worldview. And so that is so necessary. And we talk so often times about, you know, discipleship, but for children to think about that and to think, what biblically did, did God tell us about that? Well, throughout the Bible, but especially in the Old, right there in the Old Testament, we see a command to train children. And in fact, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, but all of Deuteronomy, Moses is leaving his counsel to the children of Israel, but for fathers to their children, their grandchildren, generation to generation to generation. And I think of Ephesians, or of Deuteronomy chapter 6, really giving the, these commands, you know, fear the Lord, keep all of his statutes and his commandments. But then it goes on and I command you to pass this on to your son and your son's son. And O Israel, do these things and, and do this that it might be well with thee and that thou might increase mightily. And he, he goes on and on. So as we look at this, we see it's important for parents to, to, to be involved teaching their children, especially fathers, fathers and mothers, but especially even men to take the role here uh, and so oftentimes we you know, complain about, oh, no prayer Bible reading in the schools. Well, sometimes it's not in our homes either. Um, but uh, why, let's talk about education. Why is this so important as we look at this, you know, fearing the Lord, obeying his laws, and that, that what brings these blessings from that, their prosperity and life and security. Um, but what does it mean when we're talking about Christian education? What, what does fearing the Lord have to do with, with training our children and educating our children? Well, first of all, obviously, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if a child does not fear the Lord, they cannot uh, have wisdom. 
And so in order for a child to fear the Lord, first of all, they have to know who he is. They have to know what he has, he expects of us. They have to know something about what he has done in the past. Um, and when a child develops this awesome view of our holy God, then they naturally begin to fear him, not, not always just in the sense of they're afraid of him, but they understand his magnificence and his power and his knowledge and his beauty. And when a child begins to understand that about God himself, then they are, they, they are naturally going to want to obey him and reverence him and worship him. And so, so what I like to say to parents is that secularized education can never teach a child the fear of the Lord. They can never help a child understand who God is and why we reverence him and worship him and think he's so magnificent. A secularized education can never do that and will never do that. And so if a child in their educational process never develops a fear of the Lord, they will not have ex great wisdom and they will make decisions that end up ruining their lives. And so to de develop a healthy fear and respect of God is absolutely foundational when it comes to uh, educating a child if they hope to have a bright future. And Jeff, I'm, in a bit, I'm going to ask you to make a case for Christian education, and we're going to be talking to you about what that looks like. But in the context of this command to fathers, to their sons and their grandsons, it was a continual, it was a regular thing, which takes me to what you're saying. If a public school has a kid, child for 35 to 40 hours, it's pretty impossible to do the kind of things that Deuteronomy is talking about. So therefore, but the fearing of God is where it started with. That's what Isaac asked you about. But let's go move now. I want you to build out a little bit about the obeying God's commands. How does a true Christian education, which we'll define a little bit later, um, how does that accomplish? How does a Christian education actually accomplish both the fearing of God and then the important part of obeying what God says. Well, I think that once a child has a proper fear and respect of God, they understand that he knows best. His way is the best way. And in a child's heart, we can't just give children a bunch of do's and don'ts. But what we have to do is show them that God's way is the best way. And God's design is the one that actually works out best in the real world. And so uh, I think that, you know, sometimes we've gotten a little bit off path in some schools and it was real legalistic and it was just a bunch of do's and don'ts. That's not healthy. But what is healthy to show them the beauty of God's good design in every area of life. And when we do that and show, that, show kids that, hey, if you follow God's commands, it naturally produces blessings on your life and blessings on our culture. And the reason that we have a nation today that is the most prosperous and productive in the history of mankind with all of our flaws right now is because our founding fathers understood that if they would obey God's command and operate the government and operate business and operate everything according to his plan, that it would produce a little bit of the paradise that was lost in the fall. And so yeah, we must help kids learn that God's laws were put in place to protect us, not restrict us, and that all of God's laws are filled with the love of God. Just imagine our world. Just imagine our world if we simply obeyed, everyone obeyed the Ten Commandments. What kind of world would that be? You wouldn't need police. You wouldn't need attorneys. You would, because everybody would be honest. Nobody would be killing anyone, and, and, and people would be faithful in their marriages. That's just the Ten Commandments. And God has given us this whole book filled with his, his precepts so that we might live healthy and beautiful lives. So, Jeff, I, I like this, too, you know, talking about training these children in the precepts of God. But I think a lot of people my age that have school age children, it's not even on our radar. Whether you know, are my kids going to a secular? My kids are just going to school. You know, the bus comes, they go to school. It's compulsory. You know, I can't not send my kids to school. What do you mean? Why do I? Why do I need to worry about a, a Christian education? What do parents need to look for? And, and then there are others who maybe send their kids to a private school, and maybe it even has a Christian name on it, but it's it's not teaching them what you just said. And, and in fact, I'd say the vast majority of parents in America, even Christian parents, their kids are not getting what you just described. 
How do parents like me, how do we look at our children's education and how do we judge whether this is truly a Christian education or not? Well, uh, I speak at Christian schools all across America. And one of the first things I want to do to determine whether or not this Christian school is actually giving a child a biblical worldview is I want to talk to their seniors, their juniors and seniors, literally. If I were looking for a school today and my girls are grown and married, but if I were looking for a school today, I would, I would, I would sit down with the school and say, what is your, what does your model graduate look like? That's what I would ask. And then I would say, can I talk to some of your seniors? And I would sit down and ask them many, many questions. I want to see who they are, who have they become as a result of being in this Christian school. And then I would ask the school, what is your plan? to guarantee that your children, your students are graduating with a biblical worldview, and then I would ask them, what textbooks are they using? You know, what is their curriculum path and plan? I would look into all of that, uh, and that would help me know whether or not this is truly a Christian school um, in word and deed, or just a Christian school in name only. And, and Jeff, let me take that a step further, because uh, at an earlier conversation that I had with you, actually, we discussed this on our Stand in the Gap Today radio program. Um, you, you said something that I have repeated because I felt it was so powerful. But you gave three questions that you would ask of a, of a student who is graduating, whether or not they had certain markers in their life. And that would be an indication of whether or not they got a Christian education or not. Uh, I want you to share that uh, with our viewers again right now, because um, it's, it's something that sticks and people can measure. And I think that's what we want right now. How do you know graduate who graduated maybe from a Christian school, did they actually get a Christian education is the question. What questions would you suggest people ask and consider? The first thing I'm looking for is do they know and love Jesus Christ personally, passionately? Now that seems so obvious, but I've been to Christian schools where I couldn't find a single student in the high school who loved Christ, who had a personal relationship with him. That is the God's honest truth. I wish I couldn't say that, but that is the truth. So I want to know, did, did the culture of this school, obviously the families should be heavily engaged in this, but did the culture of this school result in this child loving Jesus? Secondly. Do they have a well-developed biblical worldview? Could they defend the faith? Do they understand other worldviews and how the Christian worldview is, works out better than all of those other worldviews in the real world? And third, do they have a sense of purpose and calling? Do they know why, what makes them human? Do they know what, what their place is in this world? I'm not saying every 18-year-old kid is going to have a perfect understanding of their career path. But do they sense that God has placed his call upon them, stamped his image upon them, and therefore they must go into this world and take their place and bend creation back to God's design? And that's what I'm looking for when I'm considering whether a school has done a good job with a student or not. And ladies and gentlemen, as you're watching, I would say if you have children in school, if you are part of a grandparent, do your children, do they love God? Do your grandchildren, do they love God? Or do your students, teacher in the classroom, do your students love the Lord? Can they answer the basic questions of life? Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? What's my purpose? And do they have a sense that God has a call on their life, that they're not their own, that they belong to Him? Well, that's, that'll make a big difference. Jeff, in the last uh, minute here, as we close this part out, the church in the pulpit we know biblically has a role, but the responsibility primarily given to the fathers and the mothers in the home. But from this perspective, um, how good of a job do you think is being done right now by our pulpits and our churches and our homes in America when it comes to Christian education? Is it right on mark? Is it going the right direction or is it floundering or going the opposite direction? How would you, what would you describe it to be right now and which makes this whole subject we're discussing how important is this, this subject that we're discussing? Well, if Christian education uh, is, or education of any kind is really discipleship of children, churches ought to be heavily engaged. Unfortunately, most of them are not. They're not heavily engaged in training parents and grandparents to teach children at home, and they're not that heavily, they're not, many of them are not engaged at all in K-12 education. 
And I, I say this with all the kindness in the world. I, I went into the pastorate again, not thinking that I was going to be involved in education until it dawned on me that it was one of the greatest tools to disciple children. Pastors are afraid of this issue. Uh, I, I hate to say it. I want to be as kind as I possibly can because I love every pastor in this country. But pastors are scared to death to touch education. But what I'm saying to you as, as a pastor today, listen to me. If you want the next generation to know Christ, love Christ, and serve Christ, you had better get involved in K-12 education because there's a war going on. And whether you realize it or not or, or choose to get engaged, there's a war going on for the hearts and minds of your children. And this world has won that war to a great degree. It's time the church steps up and gets back engaged in this battle. To that I say, amen, Jeff. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope you got that. We are in a battle. Are we winning right now? No, I would say we're not winning. Why? Because we're not doing what God told us to do. And that's why we're talking about the importance of Christian education. We'll be back in just a moment for some concluding thoughts. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. And today as we talk about train up a child and Christian education, we're talking with Jeff Keaton, the founder of Renew a Nation. And Jeff, you've made it so clear that biblically parents, fathers and mothers and, and in family and church family, but the goal is to pass on to the next generation a biblical worldview. We call that discipleship. And you made it so clear from the very beginning, we're talking about the discipleship of children. And, and I think that's kind of a new concept maybe for some people. And so there might be some parents listening or grandparents or, or other extended family members or concerned folks who are part of a church that are involved with training children in the church. And they say, yeah, we, we want to disciple the children of our church. We want to disciple our children in our home. Can you summarize all that you've done today in telling us about it? Can you make, kind of summarize this as a parent? I'm looking, I want to disciple my children. What are the markers for am I giving them a Christian education? Am I discipling them biblically? So first of all, I would like to say that uh, our, our uh, mission at Renew a Nation is to inspire and equip the family, church, and school to give children a biblical worldview. That's a three-stranded cord that is not easily broken. When the family the church and the school are all teaching God's truth, all going in the same direction. The chances of those children growing up to know, love, and serve Christ are, are really high. So again, as I kind of mentioned earlier, you know, the goal for every parent is, is to, first of all, take responsibility. It's not some pastor. It's not a group of educators at a Christian school or a non-Christian school. It's not their primary role to make sure your children grow up and know the Lord and walk with the Lord and understand how to defend their faith. That's your responsibility. And dads, listen, it's ultimately your responsibility. And you need to take charge of that and not just hope and pray it happens, but put together a plan of how that can happen. Uh, I, this is a, a shameless uh, sales pitch, but we have a brand new book coming out. It just crossed my mind called 50 Things Every Child Needs to Know Before Leaving Home. And in this book, we have put this whole list of 50 things and a whole bunch of things you need to do under each one to help parents, especially in grandparents, engage in the worldview development of their children. And so I would you know, challenge you to connect with us at RenewNation.org. That book will be out in about four weeks. And it's a plan. It's an absolute plan to help every parent be able to do that. And, and Jeff, uh, we're going to continue this discussion next week because this is only part one. So ladies and gentlemen, as we're watching, as you're watching right now, uh, hopefully we've whet your appetite in relative from the standpoint of responsibility for Christian education. God established it. Fear God, obey his commands. Father, mother, you're the primary role, but teacher in a classroom, if you're in that spot, pastor in the pulpit, you've got a total responsibility to help this to be accomplished for the glory of God. So how are you doing in this matter? Well, do your children love God? 
Do they, can they answer the key questions of life? Do they sense God's call on their life? If they don't, they're not getting a Christian education. If they do, you're on the right track. Next week on this program, we're going to go further into, well, we're going to talk about why your children, if they are in public school, the Egyptian schools, put it biblically, why they need to be out. We're going to compare contrast what's happening in that public school versus a Christian education and more next week and give you options. You don't want to miss it. Well, thanks for watching us today. Contact us. Let us know that you are watching. Pray with us. Stand with us in prayer and financially.